Some of these niggas, I don't never see these niggas in the street, man. You know what I'm saying? We be out in the open, man. We just we ain't hiding, cause we ain't over nobody, stole nobody money, man. Nigga, doing everything you stand for. If you gay, that's cool, but be gay and come on out and, and be that. Don't be in front of us and act like a straight up G, and then you get over here and you let any boy bust up your back. The Houston rap duo Underground Kings was at the peak of its career on the charts and on the way to a Grammy nomination when tragedy struck in December. That's when Chad Butler, known as Pimp C, died in a Los Angeles hotel room. The cause of death is still pending. His mom thinks he was poisoned, and there was someone with him when he passed. Right off the rip, I'm like, what happened? What happened? Like, what happened? And all I get back is, well, he was in his room by himself, and they found him. I'm like, well, was the door, did it have that thing on it? Like, was it the lock? Like, like, tell me something. Just this week, the L.A. County Coroner's Office ruled the rapper's death accidental and attributed to a combination of a disorder, a sleep disorder called apnea, and prescription strength cough syrup. I don't think the sleep apnea did it because I got, I got sleep apnea, but it never been, you know, that tragic. Or, or close to tragic. Because if the door wasn't locked, that means... December 29th, 1973, Crowley, Louisiana. A kid by the name of Chad Lamont Butler entered the world prematurely as the first and only child of Chelson and Westland Butlers. After the child's birth, the young family immediately moved to Port Arthur, Texas, a place that Chad considered to be his home. Due to prematurity, Chad had numerous health-related issues growing up, including a birth defect that causes legs to point inward, digestive problems, poor eyesight, and numerous bouts with pneumonia as a child. As the son of a trumpet player, who at one time was even performing with Solomon Burke, Chad was always surrounded by music. Their home was always filled with jazz, blues, and soul music, with some of his earliest influences being B.B. King, Ray Charles, Jimmy Smith, Jimmy McGriff, Marvin Gaye, and many more. Inspired by the greats, Chad started to learn many instruments by ear, including piano, trumpet, drums, and flugelhorn way before learning anything about musical notation. While his parents separated when he was only 6 years old, the new man in Chad's life was also connected to music. After the separation, his mother Wesley married a man who was a band teacher by the name of Norwood Monroe. Luckily, the new man in the house didn't cause any tension, and together with Chad, they even started to bond over their shared passion, with Norwood teaching him how to read music. In 1983, Butler experienced his first exposure to rap music when a friend loaned him an early Run DMC album. After hearing the record, he instantly became a fan. Despite being 10 years old, Chad started to educate himself on rap origins and learned everything that he could about a genre that so captivated his imagination. While his interest in rap music was growing, he continued to pursue a more traditional musical route and as a teenager, he joined the choir, played numerous instruments at school, and even received a Division I rating on a 10-year solo at a UIL choir competition. Regardless, Chad's passion for hip-hop was slowly starting to overwhelm him and encouraged by his stepfather, who would later influence him to incorporate more musical instruments into his sound, he began writing and creating music of his own. While still in high school, Chad started to work on music with fellow musicians, including Mitchell Queen, Bernard Bunby Freeman, and Jalen Jackson, before eventually settling into a rap duo together with Bun B, calling themselves UGK, or Underground Kings. So when, when, when Pimp and I first became um, rap partners, we were not technically in a group together. We were part of a collective of people. There were certain groups, there were solo artists, dancers, DJs, producers, and so forth. So Pimp was already in a group with a person, with another person, Mitchell Queen, and that was actually, they were called the Underground Kings. I was in another group with a person, Jalon Jackson, and we were the PA Militia. At a certain point, we decided to merge both of those groups, and then we became 4BM, which was four black ministers, but menace like M-E-N-A-C-E, as oh. opposed to, not church ministers, like, like starting menace. Menace, menace. Yeah, like minister okay. society, menace. Minister. Like, well, by the time we as a collective decided to actually professionally pursue this as a career, um, other, life started calling for other people's. Mitchell, who was Chad's partner, got a scholarship to Prairie View. He's like, I'm going to play football for Prairie View, you know? My partner, Jalon, was an aspiring football player. He was in his junior year. 
He sees Mitch get a scholarship. He's like, I need to focus on my football and quit this rap. And eventually life happened to everybody. We're talking about a group of maybe 16 people. And then one day we looked up and the only people that were serious about actually making a record were me, Pimp, and who became our DJ, DJ Bird. The group wasted no time and was immediately focused on the mission to become Southern rap legends. After their formation, Chad and Bumby decided to dedicate one year to get the group from the ground, and after signing with an independent label Big Time Records, the duo released two EPs, The Southern Way and Band. My, it wasn't really, to be honest, no, it wasn't a confidence in me. It was my confidence in Chad. I don't, I don't think there was a plan B for him as far as, as life was concerned. Like, all he ever wanted to do was music. You know, and he didn't get the full high school experience as everybody else did because he was sick in high school. He had a, um, he had an illness in high school. It was he had a very low immune system as a, as a teenager, and so he was homeschooled for his junior year to the point where he was like, you know what, this ain't even worth the trouble. Like f this, I'm not going to college. I'm not trying to do none of that shit anyway. All I want to do is this music, and I was I was absolutely sure that he was gonna make a record. I don't know about me. But I knew Chad was gonna make a record. So I was just like, I'm gonna just stick with him and hold him down. And eventually he's gonna make a record and I'm gonna be on that bit. The moderate local success helped UGK to gather enough buzz around their name that in the same year, they managed to land a deal with Jive Records. Now, with a major label behind their back, the future for UGK seemed brighter than ever. The only thing that was missing was a strong debut album. On November 10th, 1992, UGK released their major label debut called Too Hard to Swallow. The album peaked at number 37 on the US Top R&B slash Hip Hop Album chart and was met with generally positive reviews. Singles like Tell Me Something Good and Pocket Full of Stones gathered a good amount of success, with the latter even getting featured on the soundtrack to the movie Menace to Society, helping the group to get a taste of some national exposure. Despite not reaching Billboard charts, Too Hard to Swallow only solidified UGK as a sudden force to be reckoned with, and with their breakthrough album right around the corner, more and more people were starting to see their potential. Two years later, on August 30th, 1994, UGK released their second studio album, called Super Tight. This time, the album managed to break into the Billboard 200, eventually landing at number 95 on the charts, and was a great commercial success. The single front back and side to side gained similar popularity to Pocket Full of Stones and once again continued to put UGK on the map. Following their Billboard debut, Underground Kings only continued to go forward and after an additional two years, the duo released their third and most successful album at the time, Riding Dirty. The album reached number 15 on the Billboard 200 and received widespread critical acclaim, with many praising Pimsy's abilities as a producer and Bun B for his unmatched lyrical flow. Despite having no official singles or music videos, the album quickly became their biggest commercial success to date, selling 70,000 copies in its first week alone. Its popularity and influence quickly propelled the album to be classified as one of the most influential albums in Southern Hip Hop, and especially in the Houston Hip Hop scene. After finally breaking into the mainstream, the duo decided to take some well-earned time off, and instead of working on their next album, they took a slightly different approach. For the next five years, UGK only appeared on several tracks as featured artists, and despite releasing a couple of singles in 1999, which would later be used on their upcoming album, there was still no sign of its release. It's hard to say whether it was their decision to hold back the album, as it was rumored that the duo had intended to release it well before its original date, with advertisements dating back to some Jive Records albums from 1998. Throughout those five years, UGK continued to do countless shows around the states, appear in multiple interviews, and collaborate with some of the biggest rappers at the time, including Scarface, C Murder, Master P, Fiend, Outkast, Ludacris, and many more. The duo's perfect streak of success also didn't end, and in 2000, UGK appeared on two mega singles, Big Pimpin' by Jay-Z and Sippin' on Some Syrup by legendary Memphis hip-hop group 3-6 Mafia. Recipe. Yeah, recipe. <laughs> I hope to fix your drink. It's a pharmaceutical. You 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 get promethazine with codeine cough syrup and you mix it in your favorite flavored soda. 
It's not very hard, and you be, hey, man, put some Jolly Ranchers in the cup. It's a done deal. Hey, man, look, just because I'm not indulging on me, I don't know how to do it. I done had, a, I done probably had enough for all you mother You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, get you some drink. Promethazine with codeine cough syrup. You put about a, you put about four ounces in a two liter. And put some Jolly Ranchers in the bottom of the cup with a bunch of ice. Put it in a styrofoam cup now. Oh, it ain't gonna be no drink. And hey, goddamn, you got you a hell of a drink right there, boy. Both collaborations were huge successes and greatly increased UGK's recognition nationwide, continuing to fuel the anticipation for their upcoming project. Despite taking a break, the popularity of Underground Kings seemed to be bigger than ever, and with mainstream songs backing them up, it was finally the time for the next move. Unfortunately, as they were about to set a date for their next album, Pimsy got into a lot of trouble back in Houston, Texas. On December 16, 2000, Chad was arrested in Houston's Shopstown Mall after allegedly holding a woman at gunpoint and threatening to shoot her after a confrontation in a shoe store. According to the story, Butler and the woman by the name of Lakita Hullet got into an argument in the shoe store, after which Hewlett alleged that Chad pushed a gun into her side and said, I'll shoot you. Chad claimed that he simply lifted his jacket to show the gun and did not remove it from his waistband. While a couple of her friends did confirm her side of the story in the police report, one of them said that she never saw Chad pull out a gun, which was also later confirmed by a store clerk. He claimed that Chad was the calm one and Lakita was talking very ghetto. If she had not jumped on the man, this would have never started. Right after the incident, Pimsy attempted to exit the mall and enter his car, as numerous amounts of officers surrounded him and instructed him to surrender. Chad ignored the orders and was forced to the ground by officers, who slammed him down to the ground so hard that they nearly knocked him unconscious. He was transported to Houston Central Jail and was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. He posted bail of $10,000 the next morning and was initially sentenced to probation after pleading no contest and admitting to having a gun at the scene a couple of months later. With his legal trouble sorted for the time being, the underground kings were starting to plan a comeback. After a long five years, Chad and Bubby managed to gather enough momentum for Jive Records to finally greenlight their fourth studio album, and on November 13, 2001, UGK released their fourth studio album, called Dirty Money. Despite getting released with little to no advertisement, it still managed to debut at number 19 on the Billboard 200 and sell 98,000 copies in the first week of its release. However, while the group gathered a lot of attention over the past five years, the album wasn't as successful as Jive Records had anticipated. It peaked a bit lower compared to their previous album and sold 250,000 copies less, all while UGK's popularity increased twofold. Jive Records consider it to be a failure as they were unable to capitalize on this newfound interest in the group. Still, while it may not have achieved the same level of critical acclaim or commercial success as Riding Dirty, it still gathered a lot of love from the fans and the hip-hop scene as a whole. As the comeback was slowly but surely starting to take shape, more legal troubles followed. Only two months after Dirty Money release, Pimsy was sent back to prison after failing to report to his probation officer on several occasions, failing to keep up with his community service hours, refusing to pay outstanding court fees, as well as testing positive twice for weed. Pimsy's trial started on August 5th, 2002, and despite conflicting statements, after so many probation violations and pleading guilty to the incident, the facts of what had actually happened at Sharpstown Mall were irrelevant. The question wasn't whether he committed the crime, but how long he should be punished for it. His mother, Mama Wes, remembers the day as the biggest mockery of justice. After a terrible defense plan by Pimsy's lawyer, who decided to portray him as a drug addict who struggles with mental health problems and experiences manic states from his depression, the trial didn't last long. At approximately 9.50 am, the judge sentenced Chad Butler, aka Pimsy, to 8 years in prison. GK, the Port Arthur born Southern rap group, was on top. Members Bum B and Pimp C recorded a long list of albums. Until 2001, 
Pimp Z, a.k.a. Chad Butler, was arrested and charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. This was one of the things that UGK rapped about, the right. prison system. Right. Is it different? That's than ironic, that's imagine? ironic, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. His arrest and sentencing were widely protested by the hip-hop community, who along with Bun B, immediately initiated a free Pimp C campaign. With Pimp C in prison, UGK was once again forced to go on hiatus, which led to both members pursuing solo careers. While in prison, Chad married his wife Sonara and tried to make the best of it by reading tons of letters sent to him each week from his fans. After two and a half years into his sentence, Pimp C released a solo debut album called Sweet Jim Jones Stories. The album debut at number 50 on the Billboard 200 was met with a lot of positive reviews and feature material prior to his incarceration. Half a year later, Bumby also released his first solo project called Thrill. The album peaked at number 6 on the Billboard 200 and was also a great success. After spending three years in prison, on December 30th, 2005, Chad Butler was released from prison and placed on parole until December 2009. Now, as a free man once again, Butler made a promise to himself to never return to prison and was focused on his next project. He immediately got into the studio and begun writing music for his second studio album. On July 11, 2006, Pimp C released an album called Pimpolation. It featured numerous guest appearances from rappers such as 8Ball and MJG, Big Mike, Bun B, Chameleon Air, J Prince, Scarface, Willie D, Lil Boosie, and many more. Aside from an impressive guest lineup, the production was handled by several legendary producers, including Mr. Lee, a man who produced such platinum albums such as Scarface's My Homies and Tupac's Still I Rise, Manny Fresh, a legend from Cash Money Records, and even the man himself, Mike Dean. The album debuted at number 3 on the Billboard 200 and was eventually certified gold. While to many, being away for such a long time would mean a career end, this wasn't the case for Pimp C or UGK as a whole. The duo picked up where they left, and on August 7, 2007, the group released their fifth studio album, the self-titled Underground Kings. Okay, here we are. This is a historical moment. This is the first time that you saw these two individuals together in at least four years. UGK members Pimp C, the homie Bun B, and it almost didn't happen. You're getting exclusive right here. Pimp C, good to have you home, brother. Good to be here. How does it feel to be here, man? You know, uh, it's a blessing uh, to be able to come home and get treated this way. The double album contained 26 tracks, spent two discs, and featured an even impressive lineup of guests than ever before. It included Talib Kweli, Too Short, Rick Ross, Zero, 36 Mafia, Slim Thug, Outkast, Cool G Rap, Big Daddy Kane, and many more. If that wasn't enough, the album also features some international rappers across the sea, including Dizzy Rascal, following their guest appearance on Rascal's album, Maps Plus English. The producers were once again top tier, including DJ Paul, Juicy J, Swiss Beats, The Runners, Lil Jon, Jazzy Fa, Scarface, and the man himself, Pim C. The fans were dying to hear anything new from UGK for the past number of years, so once the time came, they made sure to enjoy every single second of it. The album peaked at number 1 on the Billboard 200, becoming their first number 1 album, and the single International Players Anthem became the group's only single to chart on the Billboard Hot 100 pop charts, where it peaked at number 70. This nigga was hurt when I dropped out, man. If he had his way, I would have stayed in school, but I mean, like, we put this record out. Man, I'm 16 years old. I'm, we doing shows Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And when and we really wasn't no serious money, I think we give five hundred dollars a show. But to a little nigga, man, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, man, I'm not going to school Monday. Mm -hmm. And you know, so this nigga did all he could to steer me the right way, you know. But hey, man, I wasn't trying to hear that. In the streets, this was my older brother. In the studio, I was his older brother. No, I wasn't trying to hear that. This nigga was my tutor, man. This nigga tried to steal me right, man. I wasn't trying to hear that. No, but uh, everything you were telling me was right, homie. It was right, man. I appreciate it too, man. This nigga always told me the truth, you know. 
the monstrous success of their long-awaited album fully solidified UGK as Southern rap legends. After so many ups and downs, the group was finally back on its feet, sitting at the top of the rap game and sharing the seat with some of the hip-hop greats. The duo's resilience to trials and tribulations made the taste of success even sweeter. And now, at last, UGK got to finally revel in the well-earned limelight. Can you tell me the secret to having this kind of longevity? Um, I just follow what Too Short taught me, man. He said, just don't stop rapping. And I just kept on making the kind of records that the people down where I live at like. I feel like if you can make your own little town rock, and if you can make the people in your neighborhood jam, you can make anybody love it. But we just stayed true to it, even when, you know, everybody else was doing some different things. That's all, just stay true to what you do. Unfortunately, the celebration didn't last, as only a couple of months later, tragedy struck not only UGK, but the hip-hop scene as a whole. The Houston rap duo Underground Kings was at the peak of its career on the charts and on the way to a Grammy nomination when tragedy struck in December. That's when Chad Butler, known as Pimp C, died in a Los Angeles hotel room. The turnout at his funeral in Port Arthur showed just how much he was loved and admired in this area. 33-year-old Butler was found dead in his Hollywood hotel room on December 5th. The cause of death is still pending. In early December 2007, Chad had been staying at the Mondrian Hotel in West Hollywood, California, where he had been working on new music and performing with a fellow artist, Too Short. On the morning of December 4, 2007, Pimsy was scheduled to fly back home, where his wife Sonara was waiting with his cousin Ed at the airport to pick him up. After not hearing from him in the morning of the scheduled flight, his wife decided to call the hotel and ask that they check on him. Hotel staff came up to Chad's room and found him completely unresponsive. After several unsuccessful attempts at CPR, Chad Butler, also known as Pim C, was declared dead at the age of 33. The news of Pim C's untimely death sent shockwaves throughout the hip hop scene, leaving thousands of fans devastated, mourning the loss of a beloved icon. I gotta come pay my respects to a pimp, you know, I grew up on his music, you know. 492 since them boys way back in the game, you know. Without, the, without Pimp, there's no bun. Without bun, there's no Pimp. The boys a duo like Batman and Robin. The coroner's report ultimately ruled his death to be accidental, attributing it to the effects of Butler's heavy usage of lean, a combination of codeine and promethazine, in conjunction with his pre existing condition of sleep apnea, which causes people to stop breathing up to 30 seconds at a time while sleeping. Just this week, the L.A. County Coroner's Office ruled the rapper's death accidental and attributed to a combination of a disorder, a sleep disorder called apnea, and prescription strength cough syrup. And our guest this morning is Bernard Freeman, known as Bun B. He is one of those who was closest to Pimp C. Good morning, and thanks for being here. Now, Thank you. you were one of Chad's best partners, grew up with him. But you're going to be doing a concert tonight. Yes, I am. Um, now, now, this concert is following the release of the information, which says that sleep, apnea, yes. and syrup. And we know that syrup on the streets usually has codeine. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. You, when you heard that, what, what went through your mind? Well, it, it was sad, but it's, it's, it's a definitely real thing, you know, living in Houston, Texas. Um, being um, a person of, that affiliates with the, the, the common man on the street, we all know that in Houston, Texas, we tend to, we have a problem now with the cough syrup epidemic. And while it wasn't solely the cause of his death, we have to be very real about the consequences to some of these things. Um, Pimp C did have a prescription for it, but you have to be very careful when you get prescriptions for certain things because sometimes you can not tend to... Um, go a little too far with some of these things. They have very strong addictive qualities, pills and syrups and whatnot. So um, to anyone out there, you know, that mm -hmm. thinking about sipping syrup or currently abusing syrup, it may want to take a very good look at yourself, a long look at yourself in but, that cup. But in this case, we were told that the bottle did not have a prescription label on it. Right. Well, I, actually, I wasn't in Los Angeles, so I'm not sure exactly about the bottle itself. But... Um, in, in Houston, on the streets, um, there is a you know there is an epidemic with, with the people sipping the cough syrup, and it's is something it, that's going to have to be addressed. Butler's body was transported back to his hometown to Port Arthur, Texas, where he was laid down to rest on December 13, 2007. The funeral was attended by many fans and residents of Port Arthur, with the mayor, his mother Westland Monroe, and Bun B being a few of the many speakers at the service. 
The death of PMC sparked tributes from the fans and fellow artists around the world, highlighting his impact on Southern hip hop and his legacy as a talented rapper, producer, and cultural icon. Oh man, I had to show my respect, man. PMC brought me in it, in the game, you know. Houston rapper Chameleonaire says Pimpsey's talents will be greatly missed in the hip hop industry. Man, it's just his personality, man, his spirit, his soul. Like, there's nobody that can duplicate that. As the shock of the unexpected tragedy was making its way throughout the community, questions surrounding Pimpsey's death were starting to arise. The suspicion that maybe this wasn't the case of accidental overdose was starting to become prominent in a lot of people's heads. Too short. One of the people who saw Pim C just 24 hours before his death, during an interview with Vlad TV, speculated if Pim C was alone in his room on the night of the murder. Julia Beverly, a woman who wrote a book detailing the life of Pim C, during one of the interviews, talked about Pim C's mother, Westland, believing that her son wasn't alone in the room on the night of the murder and was instead poisoned by one of the people present. But there are some alternate theories which I kind of explore in the book. Um, his mom thinks he was poisoned, and there was someone with him when he passed who was a very shady, <laughs> strange character. So there, there is a, actually a person of interest, according to his mother, that, that she believed had something to do with his death. The mysterious man believed by Pimsy's mother to be responsible for her son's death was a guy called Buddy. It is speculated that Buddy was not only present in the room on the night of Chad's death, but also allegedly poured something into his drink causing him to feel unwell. This theory was seemingly confirmed by Pimsy's cousin, Edgar, during an interview with Super Tight TV. So, tell me about Buddy. Can you... Buddy the nigga who killed my cousin. You got that from a reliable source? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What did you hear? So... The story I heard, it was multiple people inside the hotel room. Um, female, I think maybe it'd be a male and another male probably. So Super tight exclusive. So C went to the restroom and Buddy said, look, y'all don't tell, don't say nothing. I'm going to play a joke on Pimp. And he poured something into his drink. And when he came back from the restroom, he started drinking it and almost immediately start throwing up blood. And what made me believe that, I packed C bags after he passed. From that same hotel? From that room. same hotel. I pulled back the cover of the bed and there was blood in the bed. Mm. So that's what made me believe that story to be true. If the mystery of what happened on the night of December 2nd wasn't enough, the autopsy report was also starting to raise questions. While the official statement claimed that the cause of death was ruled to be accidentally an overdose in conjunction with Chad's pre-existing sleep apnea, the facts just weren't lining up. Pimsy's cousin, the woman who wrote Chad's biography, and one of C's longtime affiliates were all disagreeing with the public statements made by the official reports. Um, but as far as like physical evidence, I had a, I had some other people review the autopsy report and things like that, and they, they didn't really come to a, a, a solid conclusion as far as, you know, a, any foul play or things like that. Um, but a lot of people have heard that he died of a codeine overdose, mm -hmm. which is not true at all. Um, that was actually, you know, the the day he passed or, or, or the day that the results of the tests and whatnot were not announced, the coroner said, you know, he did not overdose. Mm. And then you had all these newspapers that said that he did overdose. Mm. So that was just... Irresponsible, irresponsible media that came up with that story. I think it's it's, it's it's close to somebody did tamper with my man and and take him out the game. Um, I don't think the sleep apnea did it because I got I got sleep apnea and it's been years that I didn't even know I had sleep apnea mm. and I I've done you know a lot of different things. I'm I'm taller than him and I'm a, I'm a bit more was was a bit more active. But it's plenty of times I've, I've, you know, went to bed full of this and that, this and that. And, and I remember sometimes feeling like I'm choking in my sleep because you actually stop breathing. And, and so, but I, but it never been, you know, that tragic or, or close to tragic. So I don't, I don't think he just died off no 
cough syrup and no and no sleep apnea. You gonna ask some medical questions, and what she's asking is, with no traces or nothing found in the uh, what do you call it, autopsy or the uh, what's the thing called when toxicology. you toxicology report? So, no, and why? I think what messed it up, and I'm gonna just say it like this. Yes. People did so much maneuvering around the, out, the autopsy to protect what was they might have thought was going to show up. So that kind of cha- changed the outcome of what really was came out. In other words, they weren't looking for that. They wasn't looking for that. What do you think they were looking for? Drink? They were looking for drink. And they found small traces of that. Mm-hmm. Not enough. They did say it wasn't enough to kill. Now, y'all do know they said it wasn't enough to kill him. Yeah. And, and he had a prescription for that. And they tried to blame it on sleep apnea. Yeah. And them both is what took him out, is what the yeah. uh, coroner's report said. But, you know, Mama mama died saying my baby was poisoned with cyanide. Mm. Mm. Her wish was to raise up enough money to have the body exhumed. exhumed. Yes. To do a, her own independent one. But she died for having that feeling. On top of all of this, Pimping Ken, one of the people who were present at the funeral, claimed that Pimp C looked nothing like he did when he was alive, with his head being twice as big as a regular one. Man, you know, the, cra- the crazy thing about that funeral, right? The funeral was big. Yeah. But nobody talked about when we went and viewed the body. Yeah. Only a hundred people was involved. Man, Pimp C head was this big. Stop it, man. Are you serious? Man, yeah. it was this big, dog. I mean, you know. He was darker too. Hey, two, two. And he hey, was darker. His, he was darker his, his lips would look like plastic. His, his whole face. So too short looking at me. We looking at each other like you know, and everybody just looking at each other like crap. We couldn't even believe the shit we Bro, were saying. With all of the facts being disputed left and right, a lot of the people were starting to believe that Pimp C's death wasn't just a one-off murder, but rather a bigger and more complex inside job. You see, during his career, Pimsy had always stood firm on his beliefs, calling out the music industry and refusing to conform to the current musical agenda solely for profit. And watch this, bun. I'm gonna say this too, you niggas out there think this cool, but it ain't cool. Me and this man ain't never been butt naked in no room together with no holes, pulling no orgy type or doing none of that whole ass you niggas out there be doing, thinking you doing some fly shit. Nigga, if you're in a room naked with some other niggas and some broad, them niggas looking at you. Yes. And it's that, it's that gay, and you need to get on some other shit. Me and this man got nothing but respect for each other. We ain't never pulling no train. We ain't no motherfucking freaks. We some family men. We getting this paper. You know what I'm talking about? And I had to put that out there, bun, because a lot of niggas doing a lot of full gay out here, man. You know what I'm saying? These niggas they flip floppy, they pitching and they catching with these boys, and they doing all this. So, and if you gay, that's cool, but be gay and come on out and, and be that. Don't be in front of us and act like a straight up G, and then you get over here and you let these boys bust up your back. These record labels don't want artists to talk to each other. Mm-hmm. We get to talking too much, we just might put a union together. Mm. And if we unionize, they can't win no more. Right. Don't you fools realize that uh, we can get a whole bunch of money together? Didn't y'all just see what happened with Bun Single? Mm. Don't you, don't you, don't you guys understand that if we bring this thing together and put all this old petty and it's petty, man. It's, yeah. He said this and, and this one over here said that, and when you finally boil down, the man ain't said nothing. nothing. You know what I mean? Man spit something on the record, and this fool over here assume he talking about this one over here. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting back watching this. I'm like, man, these boys is tripping. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? These claims of Chad's death being an inside job were also discussed by numerous musicians within the industry, including Orlando Brown and Too Short himself. That's what they well, That's what they didn't want, because he was pulling people together. They killed my brother because he was pulling people together, and 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 they was about to buy. They was about to do a black distribution. It's a distribution company, all black on all black music distribution company. Ah uh, man, you taking money out out of, out of out of the industry's pocket. After more than fifteen years, the mysterious details of what happened on the night of December second, two thousand and seven, remain unsolved to this day. 
leaving hundreds of fans around the world grappling with loads of unanswered questions and lingering suspicions. While the death of PMC was nothing short of unusual, his spirit continues to live on through his timeless music and the impact that he had on the world of hip-hop. His raw talent, unapologetic honesty, and unwavering dedication to his craft have left an indelible mark on the music industry, inspiring countless generations to come. Rest in peace, Chad Lamont Butler.